Well, I am very honored to be among the many scholars in the last nine years who have presented this lecture, the Nancy Kanner Distinguished Lectureship on Intellectual Diversity. And I'm really, really grateful that Lester Mons invited me to do this this year. And I want to acknowledge the same people he just did. I won't reiterate them because of time. But there has been a, a community of people helping put this lecture together. So I have some specific goals to do today. I want to position the rationale for engaging diversity in the affirmative action cases. I want to make a case, however, for its being really important, way beyond those affirmative action cases, in three of the many, but three major challenges facing the United States. And third, I want to present an integrative dialogue program that, in fact, does address those, those, those challenges and discuss briefly what a 21st education, 21st century education ought to look like cosmopolitan and outward. So in keeping with the race theme semester, I want especially to talk a bit about what it means to dialogue across race about race. It's not easy. Hazel Marcus and Paul Moyer in a book called Doing Race say that writing, uh, in talking about the difficulty, she says, even though race and ethnicity pervade every aspect of our daily lives, every time the conversation turns to that topic, we get really uncomfortable. They delineate eight conversation stoppers that tend to come when we talk about race. There are things like, well, we're all a little bit racist, or, oh, that's just identity politics, or we're really beyond race now. So it's very difficult for us to engage the diversity that involves race and ethnicity in this country. And so learning about race and how to do that is one of the most important things in a 21st century education because race continues to be the major divide in the United States and I suspect it will be for some time ahead. So let's turn to how diversity came to be associated with affirmative action. How many students in the room feel that you don't know very much about Michigan's affirmative action cases? Would you put your hands up? Well, of course, this isn't a lecture on affirmative action, but I do want to say a little bit about it to position what diversity means and why it was engaged with those cases. So the first case of affirmative action in higher education was Bakke versus the University of California at Davis in 1978. And then there were the Michigan cases in 2003, which were Gratz versus Bollinger and Grutter versus Bollinger. From 1973 onward, through the current contest that's there with Fisher versus the University of Texas, being heard or being decided right now by the Supreme Court, there's had to be two things that universities were addressing, two issues that they had to address. The first is what's called narrow tailoring. It essentially means you can't use race too much and that you've tried some other things first. Second is what they call compelling state interest. That using race, because we shouldn't use race according to the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. So if we're gonna use race, it ought to be for a compelling state interest and for universities therefore for a compelling university interest. Our argument in 2003 was that because diversity is educationally beneficial for all students, that using affirmative action to achieve diversity meets a compelling state interest. Well, what's the evidence about educational benefit of diversity? In 1978, there really wasn't any evidence. In 2003, we had more. But we did not have the kind of empirical studies that would have helped us say, yes, diversity is causing some kinds of educational outcomes. Well, there's considerably more now, including experimental evidence. And I refer all of you to the wonderful amicus briefs that are in Fisher. They're on the University of Texas website. And you should certainly look at those, because that evidence is quite 
informative. Most of that evidence supports our argument from 2003. Yes, there are a few that don't, but the lion's share of the empirical work is supportive that there's educational value um, for diversity. But the most important point I want to make today is that diversity in higher education is important way beyond its role in affirmative action. It's important for us in 21st century education to know how to collaborate across differences and therefore having the experience with diverse others is a crucial part of our education. It's important because it addresses three of the challenges that the United States faces and here they are. There is a huge demographic challenge ahead and of course it's also a great opportunity. It's coming from the changing demographics of the country the democratic challenge is the important one of engaging everybody in civic life, which is threatened when economic inequality, either at the individual level or for certain groups of people, becomes a real problem. And the dispersion challenge, or what Fareed Zakaria calls the rise of the rest. All of these challenges call for young people to be highly motivated and skilled in dealing with people from all kinds of walks of life here and all kinds of people all around the world. So let's turn first to the demographic challenge. You all know the facts. By 2042, we will be a majority minority country. That will happen by 2023 with young people. And here's why. Here are the babies born in 2011. There are many more non-white babies born in 2011 than white babies, and they're gonna grow up. And they're gonna be what's coming to higher education, and they're gonna be who our country is. In addition, there's a huge political implication of what the demographics look like. So this is not all, all just in the future. This is 2012. And here's who voted for Obama and who voted for Romney. So 71% of Latinos, 73% of Asian Americans, 93% of African Americans, but only 39% of whites voted for Obama. And the obverse is there for Romney. Now I know there's some students in the room that are concerned when we have just these categories up here. They are not inclusive. There are many people they don't fit and they have a lot of subtleties within them. I acknowledge that, but of course these statistics come this way, so I want you to be a little patient with the fact that this is what I'm gonna to have to talk about. The current national conversation about immigration reform, that didn't just happen out of the blue, it happened because of this. Neither the Democratic nor the Republican campaign said a word about comprehensive immigration reform. This is what has brought it, and the impact of Shifting demographics in this country is not just about politics. It's about every aspect of social life. So engaging diversity has to be a national agenda. As we become a much more racially and ethnically diverse country, we're calling for leaders who have the skills to deal with who we're gonna be. There are dramatic implications for higher education. Of course, one never really knows that these projections will turn out to be the case, but it's expected that 57% of community college students will be Latino in 2050. 25% will be white, 10% will be Asian background, and 8% will be African American. And in public four-year institutions, 44% will be Latino, 33% white, 15% Asian background, 8%. African-American. Only in private four-year institutions will the majority of students be non-Latino white students. Now, 2050 is some time ahead, but I think we should be talking about the implications for higher education right now. And it's not just what's happening domestically. There's an increasing number of international students here and everywhere in the country, and they're largely from Korea, India and China. So colleges and universities won't look like they do today 
and they sure don't look like they did in 1970s. Here's the first two pages of the yearbook in 1973 and 2008. Now, unfortunately, 1973 was black and white, so you can't quite tell. But believe me, there isn't, I think, a single student of color on the first page of the yearbook in 1973. Well then, if so much diversity is happening, why do we need to engage it? Why do we have to be explicit about it? Why do we have to be assuring that students interact across differences? Won't that just happen naturally with this increased diversity? Well, I want to say not if two things go on. Not if we continue to be as residentially segregated by race and ethnicity as we are today. And not if pupil assignment in K-12 continues to be so residentially based. Unless residential segregation is markedly lower and unless K-12 becomes not as racially impacted as it is today, students will still come to colleges and universities with woefully little meaningful interaction across differences. In fact, one could say that the larger numbers of students of color from various backgrounds may make it easier for both white students and members of these other of color groups to isolate themselves in what we all call our comfort zones. Now, let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with comfort zones. Everybody needs solidarity. Everybody needs support. Everybody needs to interact with people who have some similarity and experience. So I, this is not about having only intergroup experience, it's about both and. We want both intra and intergroup experience. All right, let's shift to the democratic challenge. Democracy thrives best when there is clear that everyone has a stake in it, economically and politically. And so inequality of various sorts is a challenge for democracy. You all know the facts because inequality has been very, very much in the news of late. You know about the level of inequality and you know about the causes. You know that economic inequality in the United States is bigger than it has been since the 1930s and that it's largely in the last three decades that that's happened. You know that in that last three decades, 80% of the net income gains have gone to the top 1% of the income distribution. And it isn't just about income, it's also about wealth. Wealth is more than income, it includes assets as well, like what your housing is, what your stocks and bonds are, et cetera. And what this slide is showing us is that the top 10% of US households have 80% of US financial wealth. And the bottom 80% of US households have 7% of US wealth. So there's a huge amount of inequality, and it's not just worrying about it because it's what we know about here. It's also because it is greater in the United States than it is in 99 other countries. We are 100th in the world with respect to inequality. To illustrate it, there is more economic inequality in this country than nine European countries. There's more here than in Canada. And guess what? There's more here than in India and China, two rising countries, and in Iran. And what this, is, this, sh this slide does not show is that our partners with the amount of inequality that we have are Cameroon, Madagascar, Rwanda, Uganda, Ecuador, Mexico, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Serbia. Now, I'm not saying that the poor in this country are as poor as the poor in some other countries. They aren't. This is about the gap from the top to the bottom. And the gap matters for us. It matters not only with respect to our political efficacy, but also with respect to whether or not we can grow our economy. There are an increasing number of economists who are worrying about our inequality as dampening our potential for growth. That's because we're a consumer society, and when people don't have money, they don't buy things. Well, I could go on. I'm not going to talk about the causes, 
What is really important is to recognize that there is a group basis to all this. Whites are 30% higher income, family incomes than Latinos, 36% more than African Americans. African Americans are twice as likely to be unemployed. They're three times as likely to live in poverty and they're six times as likely to be in prison. The point is for diversity and higher education, there's an urgent need for young people to understand inequality. But class, class isolation makes that hard to do. People can't come up with social policies that address this issue if we don't know that it exists, and it's hard to know that it exists if we live only with other people from our similar class backgrounds. So there's a, a group of everyone in this room called sort of the privileged meritocratic elite. And you are because you're all in higher education. But you could also fail to appreciate the implications of inequality and imagine that your privilege is solely because of your merit. And Jacob Stieglitz, Nobel laureate economist, is pointing out that some of the rules and some of the procedures that exacerbate market forces actually advantage the people in this room. So University of Michigan students are pretty class isolated, and here they are. Over on the far left, with households that have less than $50,000 a year, that's 50% or approximately 50% of U.S. households. It is 15% of the students at the University of Michigan. Let that sink in. 50% of U.S. households have less than $50,000 a year household income. Over on the far right are, two, are the households with 200,000 or more. Only 4% in the nation are such households. But 31% of students at the University of Michigan come from those kinds of households. So students at U of M are mostly in cl class isolated situations here and at other colleges and universities as well. Michigan's not unique. So I want all students as part of diversity to learn about these inequalities so that they can address them as they are citizens and leaders, both domestically and internationally. Okay, let's turn to the third challenge, which is the dispersion challenge. Dispersion essentially means that we're in a post-American world, according to Reed Zakaria, because of the rising number of countries economically and, and politically having influence in the, country, in the world. It's the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, but many others as well. And yes, those countries have had a dip this past year in growth, but they're still doing very well. Fried Zakaria says, at the political military level, we will remain a single super world world, but in every other dimension, industrial, financial, educational, social, cultural, the distribution of power is away from the United States, away from American dominance. That international dynamic requires leaders who can relate to leaders from other countries, both governmental and non-governmental, to communicate and collaborate across all kinds of differences to essentially engage diversity. But are we ready?
But what we need to be ready are the following things. We need broad knowledge across many disciplines. We need communication, problem solving, collaboration across differences. Critical, creative, adaptive, and flexible thinking. These are the three things that the American Association of Colleges and Universities and an organization called Partnership for 21st Century Skills both stress is what we need in higher education to be ready for what the world is going to look like. So that brings me to intergroup dialogue. Its overall goals specifically address these challenges. It helps develop the sentiments and skills that we think students are going to need in the 21st century. So what is intergroup dialogue? The goals are to increase intergroup understanding, and largely that's understanding of these inequalities that I've talked about. Increasing positive intergroup relationships, especially the motivation to bridge differences and intergroup empathy. And intergroup collaboration, being able to work across differences. And it does it through a distinctive pedagogy and distinctive communication processes. It's made up, intergroup dialogues are made up of two social identity groups, white students and students of color, Arab students and Jewish students, men and women, etc. The research that I'm going to present briefly today in, involves gender and race, but we run all kinds of intergroup dialogues here at the University of Michigan. It has a four module curriculum. In the first module, students learn how to dialogue. They don't come knowing how because dialogue requires that you listen and you ask questions and you probe other people's ideas and we're used to doing what I think is serial monologues in most of our discussion classes. I wait for you to be finished and then you wait for somebody else to be finished so we can do our thing. In the second module they learn about identity and inequalities in power and we have any number of structured activities that occur in the classroom to help them understand. The most powerful of it, I think, is the storytelling. It turns out neuroscientists and everybody else now understands why storytelling is so powerful for learning. The third, the third module is a dialogue about hot topics. The students themselves, there are a lot of IGR students in this room today, they choose their own hot topics. And the question is, okay, now that they've done the first two parts of this course, can they dialogue or do they still argue and debate about these hot topics? And fourth is a section that's involved alliance for collaboration and the students are put into groups of four, two from each identity group, off to do a project with each other, but the important thing is what do they learn about the interpersonal and intergroup relationships while doing that project? There is a distinctive pedagogy. In some ways, intergroup dialogue looks like every other course. It has readings, it has written assignments. What's different about it is its level of structured interaction that occurs in the classroom. First of all, it's, it, it's equating the statuses by having the two groups of students in equal numbers. And then there's lots and lots and lots of active learning exercises or activities, along with the readings and the written assignments. And thirdly, it's facilitated. We certainly don't believe that this is the kind of thing that you get just by sitting and chatting with somebody who's different from you. It requires some real facilitation. The distinctive communication processes are of two sorts. The first we call dialogic because they involve how to dialogue. Active listening, asking questions, following up the idea that someone else just gave in class commenting on that idea. It's a, it's a discourse of inquiry. And of course there's also sharing, but our students know how to share. It's much more the learning how to do the other dialogic processes. And then there are critical processes or critical thinking processes identifying my assumptions when I talk. But I also want to identify other people's assumptions when they're talking and we need to do critical analysis of inequalities, and the most important part of all is personal and collective critical reflection. 
At the end of every dialogue class, I'm sure it doesn't happen every time. What should happen is the facilitator should say, what did we learn today? You know, we learn in every class we're in, but usually our instructors don't ask it at the end, what did we learn? But it's really important to collectively talk about what we learned today. All right, does it work? I've talked about what it is, does it work? Right after 2003, when the Supreme Court heard our, 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 our cases, I knew I couldn't do anything about admission. I don't work in admission. But I was aware that the research that was available in 2003 did not involve very much experimental work. So I set out with collaborators at eight other universities and many people here to investigate with experimental methods and rigorous quantitative and qualitative methods to investigate when you explicitly leverage diversity as an intergroup dialogue, what happens? Are there effects of intergroup dialogue? So we're raising two research questions. Does it work? Especially does it work on those three sets of outcomes, intergroup understanding, intergroup relationships, and intergroup action? And how does it work? What are the processes by which effects happen? Here are the, eight, the, the, the nine universities with Michigan, Arizona State University, Occidental College, Syracuse University, and the universities of California, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Texas, and Washington. Why these universities? Because they had intergroup dialogue programs. This was not a project to go set them up. This was a project to study them, so they had to exist. All of these universities are places where people from the University of Michigan went off and started programs someplace else, with one exception. All right. Here's the research design. Students can't just enroll for intergroup dialogue courses at any of those campuses. They have to apply. Given that they, could, they have to apply, and this was about race dialogues and gender dialogues, we could randomly assign the applicants to either a dialogue course or to a waitlist control group. And I can't tell you how important that is. You could find change over the course of a term, but maybe those students would have changed anyway just by being in college. So we need to have a control group. So it was wonderful that these nine universities managed to do random assignment. So the dialogue group and the control group have a pretest at the beginning of the term. And then the dialogue group gets something, it gets the course. And the waitlist control group gets nothing, at least it doesn't get dialogue. And at the end of the term, there's another post-test survey. And a year later, this is 16 months after the beginning of the project, there is another follow-up survey. So this is a longitudinal study as well. I'm really pleased to report that at the point of the post-test, at the end of the term, we had a 98% response rate, which includes the waitlist control students. They weren't in class. And a year later, an 85% response rate, and that's really phenomenal. This is all because we had fantastic collaborators at these institutions. Who are the participants? Well, we ran 52 pairs of courses and, wa and waitlist control groups, 26 pairs of race courses and race waitlist control groups, 26 gender courses and 26 gender waitlist people. Altogether, there were 726 students in the dialogue courses across these nine universities, 721 in the waitlist control groups. We wanted to have an equal proportion of white women, white men, men of color, and women of color. And as you can see by the pie charts, we basically accomplished that. Now, I don't mean that all students of color are the same. They aren't. But at no school, including Michigan, which has the largest dialogue program in the country, are there enough students of color, first of all, on the campus, and secondly, applying for these courses, that we could do an experiment looking at a race dialogue that would have white students and African-American students and another one that had African-American students and Latino students, it wasn't possible. So this is a limitation of this study. 
In addition, we did qualitative, a lot of qualitative work that I'm not going to talk about today because of time. We videotaped an early, a mid, and a late session so we could find out what goes on inside those dialogue courses. Ten race dialogues had it and ten gender dialogues. We interviewed all the students in those dialogue courses that were videotaped, 248 of them. And the part I'm most happy about, this curriculum was the same at every, of, every one of these nine institutions. The same readings, the same exercises, the same assignments. And that meant that the final paper that was assigned to these students in all 52 of those dialogue courses across nine universities was the same paper. So we could content analyze that 720 papers for what did the students say about what happened to them in their intergroup dialogue courses. Okay, let me just say a word about what is an effect, because I'm gonna turn to what the effects are. An effect is that the increase among the dialogue students is significantly greater than the increase among the waitlist control group. That's what we're looking for. All right, intergroup empathy. It's one of our main measures of positive intergroup relationships. So look over there at the left, they start out the same, the two groups of students. And then the dialogue students increase in their intergroup empathy over the course of that term. And the waitlist control group doesn't do anything. And then there's a little fading. Guess what, faculty? You know, the learning that our students have in our classes, it fades a little after they leave us. <laughs> But that difference, that difference at the end is still a significant difference between the dialogue students and the control group students. Now remember, these are the same kinds of students. They both wanted to have a dialogue course. They were just randomly assigned to one or the other. So we know this is an effect. And here's a student talking about intergroup empathy. I had to learn to listen carefully to my classmates so that I could better understand their perspectives and experience empathy. At times this was challenging, but it helped me to open my mind and to understand other people from different identities. Here's pretty much the same picture with respect to increased understanding of structural causes of inequality. Again, they start out the same. The dialogue students significantly increase during the term. Weightless control group students don't do much. And that difference at the end is still a reliable difference a year after the course is over. And here's a student talking about that. The different privileges and discriminations that the other classmates were facing, dealing with gender, ethnic identity, religion, and many others. I learned a lot from the readings, but I learned most from the experiences of everyone else around me. And here's the picture of intergroup collaboration. It has to do with things like taking additional courses to learn more, encountering uh, uh, all kinds of negative comments that people may make, uh, working with others in organizations. And here, it's pretty much the same, except that the waitlist control group also increases during the year after the course is over, probably through being in college. But again, that difference at the end of the year is a reliable difference. And here's a student talking about that. So I learned that forming alliances means getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, alliances arise out of our differences, but also from the similarities we share. We had a common goal that was basically to shed light on the issue of race and ethnicity within our society. So those were three sets of outcomes. Well, what about the rest of the stuff we measured? We measured all together 24 multi-item scales of various sorts. On 20 of those 24 multi-item measures, there was a significant impact of intergroup dialogue. Remember what an effect is, bigger increases among the dialogue students than among the waitlist control group. And that happened in both race and gender dialogues, and it happened for all four groups of students. And this impact of dialogue was evident on 21 of the 24 measures a year later. So I wanna argue these are impressive effects. They're about the size of most social science findings, not huge, but very consistent across these measures, across the kinds of dialogues, across the four groups of students and across time. 
All right, let's get back to the challenges. Well, wait just a second. I'm not gonna do much with this. We don't have time today. Uh, we have ways of quantitatively analyzing whether the process that we think happens in intergroup dialogue actually happens. And I'm not gonna go into that today, but I do wanna just show what we think should happen very quickly. First of all, there's the pedagogy. We set that up. We provide the content. It should set up. We, we do the structured interactions. We provide the facilitation. And content should set up the communication processes, and here they are. And they should together set up something going on inside the students psychologically. Greater involvement with identity, greater cognitive openness, and greater positive emotions across difference. And together, all of this should result in increased intergroup empathy and, inter and motivation to bridge differences, the intergroup relationships, and intergroup understanding and intergroup collaboration. So we, in fact, in the book, do present the quantitative analysis, but did the data fit this? And by and large, that's a pretty successful story. All right, back to the challenges. The arguments that are given by uh, Kwame Apia, or Apia, I'm never quite sure which way to pronounce it, who's a professor of philosophy at Princeton, and Martha Nussbaum, who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago. They talk about a cosmopolitan, outward kind of education, comprised of a pluralistic perspective. Appiah says, there are many values worth living by, and we should expect that people from various societies, various parts of a society, will have somewhat different values and perspectives, but within a common humanity. Critical thinking. Martha Nussman says, students have to step away from their assured truths, from the nestling feeling of being surrounded by people who share their convictions and their perspectives, so that what they've taken as natural and normal, and therefore what they're most comfortable with, is really parochial and habitual. Empathy, what Nussbaum calls narrative imagination, being able to imagine yourself in somebody else's shoes. And Appiah calls, step into their shoes. And fourth, integrating specific group-based identities with broader identifications. Listen, the spirit of multiculturalism and diversity and anti-racist education is not just to focus on difference, it really is not is to look at ourselves in much more complex ways. So Nussbaum says, students may continue to regard themselves defined by their particular loves, their families, their ethnic and racial communities, even their countries, their religions, but they must also and centrally learn to recognize humanity. Wherever they encounter it, whatever its strange guises may be, they need to know something about common humanity. So how do we do this? Well, we do it through the deliberate use of diversity to foster communication, problem solving, and collaboration across differences. We do it by a pedagogy that creates active learning and communication processes so people especially learn to listen and ask questions of each other. We do it through co collective and private reflection. We, have to talk about what we've learned. And we do it through connecting substantive and disciplinary knowledge with these intercultural competencies. So I wanna real quickly go to the end of this. We have a group of graduates, pretty gorgeous, aren't they? Ranesh Nagdain, I asked 12 graduates, six from, 12, well, six from here and six from the University of Washington to talk about how they're dealing with, as graduated people from these schools, with the demographic, democratic, and <clears throat> dispersion challenges. And here's what they have to say. Here's the question first. In what ways are you professionally and personally engaged with people from various identity groups? 
And how are you bridging differences by bringing people together? This is Aaron James. He got an MBA here as well as an undergraduate degree. My own life has been circumscribed by living in liberal urban enclaves. Now I'm working in economic development in rural areas and I'm trying in many ways to cross cultural boundaries, to understand their perspectives, including learning to hunt with rural residents. Here's Chloe Gurren Sands, my wonderful granddaughter. <laughs> By per my personal and professional lives are completely intertwined. My circle of friends include people from all identity groups. I feel I'm bridging differences and bringing people together all the time. Intergroup dialogue has educated me that the personal is political and the political is personal. Second question, what are you currently doing professionally and how are your experiences in intergroup dialogue playing a role in your professional direction and in what ways is your work addressing inequalities and aimed at social justice? Here's Denny Chan. Denny just finished law school after finishing here as an undergraduate. During my first two summers of law school, I helped litigate cases involving federal voting rights laws. I also worked on a large, on a gender discrimination case against a large corporate retailer and on a financial mortgage case involving one of the nation's largest banks. I see now how I can express my concerns for social justice in public sector law. Here's Tara Heckel, who is a nuclear engineering student at Michigan. Participating in intergroup dialogue helped me to better recognize inequalities that I faced as a woman in the engineering program. Then becoming more in touch with problems in the STEM fields helped me recognize inequalities affecting others, not just women. And Kardik Siddhar, who I think is here in the audience today, who's now in med school, my multiple response, mul med school here, my multiple responsibilities in the program on intergroup relations has sharpened my understanding of health disparities and deepened my commitment to create change in that arena. Third question, in what ways are you involved with people in and from other countries? In what ways do you consider yourself a global citizen? Claire Robel says, I gained a commitment in intergroup dialogue to learn about what I don't know and to keep up to date about international political movements. It should not be up to my Egyptian American friend to explain to me what's going on in Egypt. It is my responsibility to continue to educate myself and to have meaningful conversations with people from many countries. And Adam Faulkner, who when here was in Homegrown, was a spoken poet, was in the Prison Arts Project, in my in IGR, in my classroom, and, and now is in a writing academy, teaching in a writing academy in Brooklyn. In my classroom, I'm constantly trying to create settings that uncork creativity and grant my students permission to connect with the universal human desire for communication. In my life and work as an artist, he is a spoken poet all over New York, the local is global and vice versa. To me, being a global citizen means to consider one's own role as a contributing member of a society and not in isolation from the most pressing and urgent of global concerns. And here they are again. Well, this work, first of all, intergroup dialogue could not be done with just a few people. This project certainly could not have been done without funders. Here they are, two foundations, and the book is being published by a third foundation many units within the University of Michigan supporting this work. Here are people at the University of Michigan who are maximally involved in this, and here are all the collaborators from the other universities. And here's a picture, also on your brochure, of the book that tells a great deal more about this work. I want to thank you for engaging with me about engaging diversity. Thank you. Thank you.